Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today is Tuesday, March 15th, 2022. This is the Senate Transportation Finance and Policy Committee. Uh, there are six bills on the agenda, and members, all of the bills uh, that are on the agenda today will be laid over. Um, we will begin with uh, Senator Chamberlain's bill, Senate File 3859. Senator Chamberlain. Senator, welcome, welcome to the committee. To the committee. Whoop, whoop. I'm okay, I'm good to go. Um, welcome to the committee, Senator. Uh, whenever you are ready to your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members, uh, for allowing us to hear this bill and helping uh, craft it. So Senate file 3859 is a result of a proposed rush line that's running from just from White Bear Lake uh, down basically uh, US Highway 61 all the way to St. Paul, a guideway as defined by statute. Uh, as proposed, uh, this guideway uh, plan will, uh, as most of them do, acquire private, pr private property, in this case business property, alter the landscape all the way through to St. Paul, and also uh, uh, testifiers will be more clear on some of the details they've been working on it for a while, um, a bridge dedicated to this, uh, to this busway, this guideway. Um, also part of this, and most disturbing for a lot of us in White Bear Lake and throughout the entire route, is that the proposal right now and again, testifier can uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but 89 buses a day are currently scheduled to run through downtown White Bear Lake. So there are a lot of challenges with this proposal, not the least of which uh, uh, our community members in, have been working on this and trying to get some changes to it. But 89 buses a day, I'll go to the aesthetic aspect of this. None of us here are against public transportation. None of us are. And I can safely say that the test fires today are not against public transportation. We are for wise, smart, reasonable public transportation that takes into account uh, input, takes into serious account the input from citizens of the community that it purports to serve. So uh, if you have not been to downtown White Bear Lake, it is a destination place. It is a rare jewel amongst the, uh, in the metropolitan area. There's probably four or five other areas similar to it in the metropolitan area, in the seven counties. Um, running 89 buses a day through downtown White Bear Lake will absolutely dramatically change the uh, aesthetics and the climate of that community. I will not say it will destroy the community, but it will absolutely alter permanently that community the beauty of that community. People go there because it's an interesting, vibrant, wonderful, lovely place. It's a beautiful place to go. So that's the aesthetic piece, but it's a very important part of this. So the, the citizens, again, are not necessarily against public transportation, but 89 buses a day post-COVID is simply, in our estimation and the, the research that uh, the uh, community group has done, simply uh, an overkill. It's simply not necessary. Now, my personal opinion, I won't uh, say that the others share this, is that I'd rather not, not have it there at all. I'd have it rather go away completely. Uh, but um, at the very least, listen to the community and their concerns and try to change this as much as we can. So the bill briefly, for those not familiar, is centers on municipal consent. It empowers the communities to have a more positive uh, role in the planning and development and progress of these uh, pr uh, projects, in this case, this guideway. Now, it, it, in short, it requires, uh, a munici uh, 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 requires the local communities to have hearings. Those hearings have to, before they have the hearings, the Met Council has to provide uh, prelim design plans. 
um, after the so many days before the hearing. After the hearing, the com communities have X number of days to approve or disapprove the plans. If they disapprove the plans, then it goes back to the Met Council. The Met Council has to have a hearing on their own. If the Met Council comes back and does not have, uh, does not want to incorporate some of those ideas or they have drastic changes to it, well then they had to go back to communities again and say, here you go again, we made all these changes or we don't accept these changes. Then the community gets some more time to have another public hearing and um, review the plans again. Uh, the other piece of this is revocation. The uh, revocation and pre-approval. So at any time before an application to federal funds, for federal funds, the communities can revoke their approval of the plan. Also, uh, most importantly is that before they apply for federal funds, they have to have approval of the communities. So I'm gonna stop there. The summary is simply um, the citizens, there, is, there, has, there are a few things that unite a community more than this has. I've been up there for quite a few years. My, my, my wife grew up there. And when you get 80, 90% of the people signing petitions and saying, uh, we really don't want it, or this has to be drastically changed, that uh, should be paid attention to and some time given to their considerations for this project. So with that, I'll, I'll yield and turn over to my testifiers. Thank you. Thank you, Senator uh, Chamberlain. First testifier I have up is uh, Mr. Bill Collins. Is this Mr. Collins? No, my, my name is Tim David. Okay, Mr. Collins, you want to come forward? Yeah. Uh, we request okay. that, can Mr. David go first? Yep, no okay. problem. But you can come forward anyhow, so we're, we're yeah, in line. Come on. Um, uh, Mr. David, I, uh, welcome to the committee. If you would state your full name for the record, uh, with whom you are associated with, and then proceed with your testimony. Yes, uh, committee members and chair, good afternoon. Thank you for allowing me to provide input. My name is Tim David. I live in White Bear Township, and I have a statement about a half, one and a half pages long. I'll just like to read that for you. Go ahead. I'm here to strongly support SF3859. This bill would provide very important checks and balances on transit projects that are proposed in our communities. It would provide significant accountability through our local elected officials. And as a matter of transparency, I am leading the group that is opposing the Purple Line previously known as the Rush Line, that is a $474 million transit project proposed to run the 89 buses, as Senator Chamberlain mentioned, every weekday through six communities from St. Paul to White Bear Lake. Our group has been meeting almost weekly for nine months, and we have literally talked to and listened to thousands of residents, and we've met with hundreds of businesses in multiple communities along that route that oppose this proposed project. And the biggest struggle that we hear from folks is that the Met Council and Ramsey County aren't listening to the opposition and are not sincerely responsive to our concerns. The overarching view is that the Met Council can do whatever it wants. You can't stop the Met Council. Yes, we are organized, and that is because the residents and businesses of these communities have asked us to be organized. People literally pull us by the arm and say, you have to stop this thing. This is crazy. This just doesn't fit. And we believe they are pulling us by the, our arm because we are the last resort. These are folks from all the communities along the line. We started with a simple booth at Mar Market Fest in White Bear Lake for 50 bucks uh, per week. Over four weeks, we got 1,200 signatures on our online petition. 1,300 people signed our in-person petition on our paper gave us their emails, we held a town hall attended by over 200 residents and business owners. Over 700 additional people signed personalized cards that were sent to elected officials. We met with over 103 businesses in multiple communities and 100 of those businesses opposed the transit project. Now the big kicker here is, there is no current mechanism to stop the Met Council or even significantly influence a project design that they want to impose on any community. Some additional context on part, partly why I'm so driven by this issue. I worked for the city of Minneapolis for 12 years as an analyst, helping nearly every city department improve how they deliver their services. I then spent 13 years working as a project manager for Deloitte Consulting, 
helping federal, state, and local government organizations evaluate and improve their processes for how they deliver services. And I would suggest that the Met Council is ripe for redesign of their service delivery. In one of the first meetings where the Met Council and Ramsey County presented to the city of Wiper Lake the proposed transit project a number of years ago, which I did not attend because I had no idea they were, they were presenting, one of, the pers one of the folks who were in the audience told me later that the Met Council and Ramsey County had such arrogance in their presenta presentation telling the city council members what was going to happen, he thought the White Bear City Council was going to throw them out of the room. But no, the city council was Minnesota nice, and generally the city council accepted there was nothing that they could do to stop this project. This was back a number of years ago, and shortly after that, a first petition opposing the project was started by an attorney in White Bear Lake in 2019, and in a few months, that petition received 4,000 signatures opposing the project. Our effort to oppose the project was reignited in 2021 because it became apparent the Met Council and Ramsey County were not listening to the opposition. And it was just this past month at a White Bear Lake City Council meeting where a council member said the part out loud. And this council member voted in favor of the project in part because as he said in exasperation, you can't stop the Met Council. They can do whatever they want, whenever they want. This is not acceptable to the voting public. The residents and businesses of our communities are fed up with being subjected to the strong arm of the Met Council, forcing projects on our communities, and we need this bill to help provide some accountability. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. David. Uh, before I go to Mr. Collins, uh, I've got Diana Longrie. If you want to make your way up to the testifying table, please, uh, and uh, have a seat. I will go back to Mr. Collins. If you would state your uh, full name for the record, who you represent, and proceed with your testimony. Thank you. My name is Bill Collins, and I own Camp Bar in downtown St. Paul. Um, before I begin, thank you all. I can't imagine taking public testimony on any day is enjoyable, but especially on such a great day where you'd rather be outside, I'm sure. Mr. David uh, made some comments that really hit home with me. He talked about how long they've been trying to get their voice heard. We feel his pain, the business owners that I work with, and it has been extremely frustrating to feel like our opinion has, has not even been uh, entered into consideration. So. Um, for years, the owners of Black Sheep Pizza, Keys Cafe, Sawadi, Tin Whiskers Brewery, and other nearby small businesses on Robert Street have been trying to get our voices heard in the planning of what is now called the Purple Line. All of us own our real estate. All of us run small businesses. Together, we compose the largest continuous street-level retail corridor in downtown St. Paul. Retail, downtown St. Paul. Believe it or not, it, we have it, and it's working and we think it's in jeopardy, and we can't find anyone who cares. I'm here to offer testimony and support for SF 3859. We think that it's critically important that input, comments, and concerns not only be solicited, but there be meaningful investigation of those comments and concerns. I can assure you firsthand that we have seen transportation projects ignore input from the communities they propose to serve. In our case, the project proposes to eliminate all street parking on Robert Street, and what I in, have indicated is the busiest and largest street level retail corridor in downtown St. Paul. Min Post recently had a story on the collapse of retail in Minneapolis's uptown. The article cited the elimination of, of street parking as a major cause. This is exactly the type of information communities need to be assured is being considered in planning. Believe it or not, when we expressed concern about the removal of parking on Robert in front of our businesses, the response we got was, your businesses will actually do better if we eliminate your parking. We've been stymied and frustrated by multiple agencies at multiple levels of government. We have already made significant changes in our neighborhood, and we found that many of these projects going on, no branch of government was aware of what the other one was doing. There was a, a project to eliminate parking on Jackson that was never taken into consideration when they talked about eliminating parking on Robert. Now another new project just came through. They made 10th Street a one-way 
and eliminated parking. 10th Street a one-way, which now means the fire trucks can't leave the station and go in either direction. They can only go in one. One way that means when you get off 94, coming into downtown, you're now confronted with a one-way. You can't just flow right into downtown. You're forced to turn. So these are the kind of, pro all of these projects have been taking place, and we can't get anyone to listen to each other. We can't get anyone to provide any sort of explanation on how they're all going to work hand in hand. Local community input could resolve these kinds of problems. It's been clear, regardless of who has the lead, that planners decide routes and modes before they get any feedback from the community. Any community input is merely seen as a formality with no potential for that input to have any influence on the project. The pandemic has had significant and I think permanent impact on who and how people will work downtown. This entire project was conceived and planned for a model of retail and downtown work that does not exist any longer. Eliminating parking on Robert was a problem before the pandemic. Now our businesses rely on takeout business and food delivery businesses. Eliminating parking there is going to deter people from using our businesses and for those services to service our business. I've been told Metro Transit is an agency that has a strong history of doing what it wants, from the Southwest Corridor problems to how the Green Line was managed during construction. Our communities have growing concerns about how these projects are planned, built, and operated. For groups or businesses that have legitimate questions and concerns, we have little ability to actually influence the project. For months, if not years, uh, our group of businesses on Robert have tried to do whatever we could to save business and ask questions about the plan. Each time we raised concerns and questions, it was like talking to a brick wall. Right now, I know of no way to impact this project. If there are negative consequences, I don't know who's going to be held responsible. Metro Transit and other agencies ignore things they don't like or don't want to hear because ultimately there is no balance or accountability. But I can tell you, if local communities have input, I know every single member of St. Paul City Council, I know people at my level that I can talk to an influence and hold responsible. Right now, I, I don't know who to go to. It's my contention that SF 3859 will inject balance and accountability. Local approval means I can take concerns to people who know me and who I know. I urge you to approve the legislation and help to bring some common sense and responsibility to how we develop transportation projects. Restoring balance will change how work gets done and give us all a legitimate chance to be part of the planning process. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Collins. Uh, next up is Ms. Longry. If you would state your full name, please, and proceed with your testimony. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Diana Longry, and I'm from Maplewood. I'm an attorney. I'm a DFL delegate from the new Senate District 44. I have programs that are posted on YouTube that discuss the best practices of placement of BRT guideways. I support public transportation. Uh, I served as the first woman mayor of Maplewood a few years ago, and I traveled to Richmond, Virginia specifically to do a comparative analysis of their successful BRT with the proposed Rush Line BRT, now called the Purple Line. And I'm here today to speak in support of Senate File 3859 for municipal approval of guideways. And this is why. And it goes beyond the purple line or the rush line. There is an impression that guideways have minimal impact on a community. That would make sense. Why need municipal approval if there's minimal impact, correct? After all, uh, don't they run parallel or incorporated into the established transportation corridors? Don't the guideways generally uh, run along the shoulders of the freeway, along the median, as part of that trunk transportation corridor that we've already established? So you would think that is minimal impact. But not all guideway projects are designed that way. And this is a great example of one that is not, in part. And what I have here is I want to show you the impact of 
the rush line, purple line, on Maplewood community. Because in Maplewood, you would think, well, Highway 61, doesn't it make sense that the guideway would be along Highway 61? where there are the commercial properties, where there are the jobs, where there is the opportunity for commercial development that is the promise of BRTs? No, that is not where the guideway is planned for in Maplewood. Have you ever been to the Bruce Vento Trail? The Bruce Vento Trail is the route of the rush line in Maplewood. The top line, the top picture, if you can see it there, is the Bruce Vento Trail as it is today. It's about 20 feet wide asphalt used by a lot of people because it intersects with the Gateway Trail. So it's a little transportation corridor all of its own. Below is from the project planner book that shows you the impact on Maplewood and the loss of the beautiful <coughs> Bruce Vento Trail, clear cutting 100 feet across. That means thousands and thousands of trees. What is the impact on the community that had no opportunity to approve or disapprove of the project. This is a good example where a guideway has a significant impact on a community. And who best to know whether or not a guideway project is going to have an impact on that local community? Is it going to be somebody sitting at the Met Council who's never been to the Bruce Vento Trail? Is it going to be somebody in Washington, D.C. who has never been to Maplewood? No, it's going to be the local officials. They are the ones who will understand the impacts of the guideway on their community. So certainly there will be some guideway projects that will have minimal impact. Like say, for instance, the one in Roseville. Minimal impact because, you know, it just follows along Snelling. What's the impact? Little or none. But in this case, you see something different. The other thing that's important about this bill is that it calls for public hearing to take testimony of the people of the community. Why is this important? Well, I can tell you as a former mayor, having a public hearing is very important because because what it does is it lets people have their comments put into the record and it's part of that formal record, the formal record having to do with the project and the review of the project. Currently, as it sits with this type of project, sure there's outreach little groups and there's, they form little groups of this people and those people and some other people, but all the comments that come through that process end up as Ms. Langer, footnotes. Could you could you wrap up, please? Thank you. Thank yes. you. Yeah. So they end up as footnotes and notes in somebody's project portfolio, rather than the public hearing uh, notes. And so with that, I'd ask for your approval. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for coming to the uh, committee, uh, Mr. Shetton and Mr. Thompson. Do you wish to uh, come and testify? Welcome to the committee, uh, Mr. Shetnan, if you'd identify yourself for the record and uh, please proceed. Great. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I'm Judd Shetnan. I'm the Government Affairs Director at the Metropolitan Council, and I appreciate the opportunity to come and speak to this bill. Uh, just so folks are aware, uh, prior to the meeting, I had a chance to talk to Senator Chamberlain about uh, the bill. And uh, when it comes to the idea of municipal consent for uh, for a guideways, we are not necessarily opposed to that. Our major concern with this particular bill is the uh, ability to revoke uh, municipal consent uh, further down the line for these projects. And so that is something that uh, I think we wouldn't mind being able to continue 
uh, speaking with um, with the senator about. I'd like to provide just a little bit of context, though. There's been a lot of conversation about the council's uh, role in this and uh, and us potentially being heavy-handed, and that there's no room for uh, or we haven't taken uh, uh, any type of. Uh, public comment on this and I, I would just like to set the record straight that the council took over this project about three months ago from Ramsey County but prior to that we have been partners with the county on this issue and there has been a significant uh, municipal uh, involvement and engagement in this process uh, there have been two uh, rounds of votes by uh, the municipalities related to this project one in 2017 and one again in 2020 by the cities of Gem Lake, Maplewood, White Bear Township, Badness Heights, White Bear Lake, St. Paul, and the Ramsey County Regional Railroad Authority. Uh, and then again in 2020, the only time that this, uh, this wasn't supported uh, by any of those communities was uh, Gem Lake in 2020, in August of 2020, voted against it. But otherwise, all of those communities voted in favor of supporting this. So I just want to make it clear that uh, the council isn't being heavy handed and I don't believe Ramsey County was being heavy handed either in this and that there was a process that was followed. Uh, when it comes to uh, the municipal consent process, this is really, um, uh, I guess, following the lines of how uh, light rail transit municipal consent works as well. And as I mentioned before to Senator Chamberlain is that we're not necessarily opposed to that, but there is significant uh, engagement up until that point and I've got Nick Thompson here with me uh, and Nick is our is our assistant general manager at Metro Transit for for capital projects and Nick is going to speak uh, just briefly about the uh, public engagement process as well mr. chair thank you mr. Shetman mr. Thompson if you identify yourself for the record and please proceed mr. chair and committee members uh, Nick Thompson deputy general manager capital programs at Metro Transit uh, just updating on the public input process on a project like this and light rail and other guideways there are numerous times that we seek uh, active public process uh, as the corridor plans are developed they can be at both the city level but in a project like this that spans across multiple cities we like to present the whole plan to the community also um, and so Ramsey County would have been the lead on that but we would help with that to make sure there is a both public hearings and public input processes with which are designed in a way that everybody can have their comment entered into the record and also that we have a, a response to that record and we have that documented and on this project and the other guideway projects those comments have resulted in changes to the project uh, by far so that public input process is extensive this project purple line itself uh, started in 1999 uh, so there was uh, public input processes over 20 years, many, too many to describe, uh, but that is critical that we have a process that we can find out what the issues are, respond to those, and reflect those in the actual project. And then, as uh, Mr. Shetton has said, we want the communities to vote on this. Uh, we, it hasn't been required for guideway BRTs, but we did, uh, the county did seek that so that we knew that if there would be support at the community level, before the council would take over the project for the development stage of that project. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Any questions from members? Senator Kent. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and this particular line does not go through my district, so I don't want to pretend it does. But um, you know, having watched and being a little further down the process with the gold line, I do know that there have been very, very rigorous efforts to engage the public in these discussions um, in our community. And so I you know, can only imagine that that process has been followed. But I would also say, because Maplewood is part of my district, I represent the southern part of Maplewood, um, the Maplewood City Council has voted twice um, to approve the purple line, to support the rush line purple line um, in 2017 and again in 2020. So there is local engagement. There is opportunity for citizens to have a voice with their uh, local electeds and uh, my understanding if I have that right is that it was unanimous approval from the council in both those times thank you Senator Kent any other comments or questions from members I'm not Senator Dibble um, thank you uh, mr. chair um, I'll just briefly um, say that uh, um, 
well, I may have an opinion on this particular line and its desirability and its advisability, I did hear a message pretty loud and clear um, from Mr. Collins and others um, expressing some frustration with knowing who to call at the Met Council to provide meaningful connection and input um, and influence um, at this point. Um, and and uh, as folks know, it's that message is resonant with me. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Dibble. And indeed, um, there's folks from the community that have expressed a good deal of frustration. And uh, I think it's incumbent upon us to listen to them. Uh, this bill, Senator Chamberlain, will be laid over. Any final comments? Yeah. Uh, briefly, if you would. Thank you. I talk really slow, Senator, Mr. Chair. So a um, um, couple quick things is, first, I thank the testifiers. Look, I all due respect to Mr. Shetland and, and um, I'm sorry, Mr. Thompson, but, you know, this, this, is, this is a shell game. Um, really, as the a, as a community members have talked about, I, back in uh, summer 21, I wrote letters to OLA, Met Council, uh, county officials, and the state auditor to give us some perspective or maybe do an audit on ridership to have, so that the, the community would have some basis of uh, asking for review and to at least change the project if not stopping it. And guess what they all did? Ramsey County said it's them. Met Council says not us. The commissioner said it's over there. Somebody said, look behind the door. It might be there. These people sent, they, nobody wanted to pick it up. The ball is always moving. It's always under on some shell, but you don't know where it's at. And you're always going to lose in this game with the Met Council and the way the statutes are written. The statutes are written, as you all well know, that has uh, pinned down people and they know they can't beat it. The statute says, you can go, you got to go to the communities, get input, but in the end, you know what you're going to get? It doesn't matter how much time and energy you spend. You're going to get what they tell you you're going to get. So that's the challenge here. Yes, they went to communities, started in 1999, um, but things change. There's pieces all over. Nobody has the full picture. So... I'm going to tell you one last little piece here. Uh, White Bear, uh, last fall there were elections. The election turned on this issue. And the new city council passed a resolution just recently said, we do not approve of this. We oppose this. Things change, times change, people change. It's changed. Now, finally, Again, nobody here is against public transportation. It's a bipartisan group of people. Nobody is against public transit. They want to be heard, and do you want? We work hard to get the trails put together. I've got a proposal for Bruce Vento on the north end of this, of the trail, and they want to wreck the other parts of the trail <laughs> with a train. So this needs to slow down, at least be audited, preferably stopped, but audited, looked into, reviewed, adjusted, and changed to accommodate the citizens and the communities so that these things work better. This isn't Republican, it's not Democrat, it's common sense, and that's all we're asking. These are beautiful areas, beautiful places, and they're supposed to serve the community. This current project isn't doing it. It's a shell game over many years, and people would like some adjustments. So I encourage support that the uh, so that these citizens up and down the line can have a little say and adjust these guide this guideway a little bit for them so thank you for the time I appreciate the indulgence thank you thank you senator chamberlain and, and uh, Thanks, senator. i think there's a difference between public input and meaningful public input and that's what senator chamberlain has just been describing uh, with that senate file 3859 is laid over Next bill on our agenda is Senator Coleman's bill, Senate file 3991. 
Senator Coleman, uh, I understand you have an A1 author's amendment. Is that correct? Yes, Mr. Chair. It's a technical amendment. And if you would offer that, please. Yes, I off author. Sorry, offer the A1 um, technical amendment. And uh, this is an author's amendment, uh, members. All those in favor of the A1 amendment, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, no. The amendment is adopted. Senator Coleman, to your bill as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll be brief as this is a very straightforward bill. Senate File 3991, as amended, is a simple bill about transparency. The bill requires the Met Council to publicly post their ridership numbers as well as their initial ridership projections for all of their buses and light rail lines. They must post their ridership numbers monthly within 60 days after the end of each month. In addition, the bill requires the Met Council to publicly post the amount and type of crime happening on all of their buses, light rail lines, and transit platforms and facilities. The point of this bill is so that the public can see how the Met Council is handling the crime epidemic and to see if they are reaching the ridership numbers which they promised before the project was completed. Thank you, Senator Coleman. Uh, Mr. Thompson, uh, I see, I don't know where Mr. Shetland went. Do you wish to testify, Mr. Thompson? Please identify, it's a different bill, Mr. Yes, Thompson. I see. <laughs> identify yourself for the record and please proceed. Sure. Mr. Chair, committee members, Nick Thompson, Deputy General Manager, Metro Transit Capital Programs. Um, General Channel, Mr. Shetland's uh, comments on this. Uh, Yes, we're, we're not opposed to this. This is data that, in general, we have. Uh, we do post a lot of this data currently, just under a different time frame. Um, you know, what we do have some, particularly around the safety, we have some bills in front of uh, this committee and others about that would help us work on the issue of safety. Um, and so hopefully that this goes along with the support for those bills, too. Um, the data itself, we still have to work through how we could break out this safety data uh, to match up the bill, and we might have some challenges with that, but in general, this is data that we have been sharing, and so posting it on the website is something that we can. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Uh, members, any questions? Senator Dibble. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, no, no question, I think this bill is fine. Um, I would just mention, I have a bill that this committee has supported um, that's parked over in judiciary now that um, would really help Metro Transit get a handle on the um, crime and safety issues on transit. So um, if we could just maybe um, think about that, those the ideas contained in that bill while we're thinking about this bill, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Dibble. Members, any other questions? I am not seeing any. Senator Coleman, final thoughts? Just thank you so much for the time and consideration. Thanks, Senator Coleman. With that, Senate File 3991, as amended, is laid over. Next bill up is Senator Kiffmeyer, Senate File 3494. And Senator Kiffmeyer, uh, I believe you have an author's amendment also, is that correct? Yes, I do, Mr. Chair, I have the A1 amendment. And Senator Kiffmeyer offers the A1 author's amendment. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, no. The A1 amendment is adopted. <coughs> Senator Kiffmeyer, to your bill as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, Senate File 3494 uh, requires the Commissioner of Transportation and the Met Council to request approval from the Federal Transit Administration to discontinue North Star commuter rail operations. Uh, the request must state that the state will not reimburse the federal government for funds already spent. And this is important, Mr. Chair, because the reason why I wrote the bill this way is that if we just discontinued North Star, uh, we would have to pay back that money. So this bill is to seek 
uh, the ability to not have to pay those funds back and instead um, just to continue the service of the North Star light rail. So Mr. Chair and members, uh, this particular rail line runs from basically you know it as the target center and then goes up to Big Lake a few miles from my home. Uh, our Sherburne County taxpayers have been subsidizing the North Star heavily. It's interesting to note that we are all supportive of transit, just not this North Star light rail type transit. Very costly. My property taxpayers in Sherburne County are heavily subsidizing every single ride and the same kind of benefit through bus rapid transit or bus service in general um, can serve us very, very well. And I think that it would enable us to have many of the benefits without the extremely high cost. As a matter of fact, members from the Met Council's own material that they handed out to you uh, today, the big handout, um, if you look at Metro Transit, three slices of 21, you'll see regular bus and where they are at. Uh, you'll look at light rail and rapid bus and then North Star. North Star doesn't even cause a blip on the radar on the very bottom of the Met Council's own documents. So clearly, this is a failed thing. It is time for us to end it and then go back to using uh, bus type service, coach service, other things like that would suit this corridor much, much better. Thank you, Senator Kiffmeyer. We have two testifiers that have signed up. <clears throat> Excuse me, uh, a Mr. Schulte and a Mr. Hickok. If both of you would please come to the testifier table at this time. And you are Mr. Schulte? Yes. <coughs> Mr. Uh, Chairman, members of the committee. Welcome to the committee. Uh, state your name and with whom you are associated and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'm Scott Schulte, uh, Chairman of the Anoka County Board of Commissioners, uh, and I'm here to testify in support of the bill. Uh, the Senate file. Uh, North Star has been an albatross around not just Sherburne County's neck, but Anoka County's neck as well. This has been a huge subsidy for ridership. Uh, Pre-COVID, on its best days, the subsidy per rider was $19.39 each rider each way. So $40 if you're taking a round trip to and from Big Lake, Elk River, Coon Rapids. Uh, that's a substantial subsidy, one that's unacceptable. Ridership numbers never met expectations from day one. They never reached 60% of expectations. Uh, this line has proven to not work. What did work two years prior to North Star commuter service going into operations, they used a commuter bus as a trial service, as a, as a uh, route right on Highway 10, running right directly next to the BNSF rail line. That commuter coach was a raging success. Across the nation had the highest fare box recovery of any transit service, 98% fare box recovery. It paid for itself. It was full all the time. And then they parked the bus and put the train on the tracks and ridership fell, uh, subsidies increased, it's time to go back to that service. We've built the infrastructure. We've got the station stops. We've got the machines to take uh, tolls, pay tolls, uh, parking lots. It's all there. We should use that infrastructure. Oh, and by the way, thank you for passing all the bills that funded Highway 10, because now we're going to remove all the stoplights and make it a quicker, safer corridor for that commuter bus. So this is an expansion of transit. This expands it all the way to St. Cloud. Currently, the commuter bus runs from St. Cloud down into Big Lake. That train or that bus will still run. Now it, it, this is expanding the full service from St. Cloud all the way into Minneapolis. So it helps transit, it helps transportation, it helps everybody. Most importantly, it helps the taxpayers of the state of Minnesota, property taxpayers of Anoka County and Sherburne County. Uh, I could go on a long time on this subject, and I'm not going to do that. You all have heard this story many times on North Star. I will respect your time and stand for any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Schulte. And I do not see Mr. Hickok uh, coming to the testifying table, and I 
do not see him online. So we will go to Mr. Shetland and Mr. Thompson. Mr. Chair and members. Mr. Mr. Shetland, uh, identify yourself for the record. Sure. Please uh, proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I'm Judd Shetland. I'm the Government Affairs Director for the Metropolitan Council and appreciate the opportunity to speak in Senate File uh, 3494. And, uh, and the Metropolitan Council is, uh, is asking that um, we be allowed to basically conduct the, uh, the study that was passed last Thursday in, um, in Senate File 3832, and also the Council, uh, Anoka County, Hennepin County, Sherburne County, MnDOT, we are moving forward with our own uh, study to look into the viability of the North Star operations ourselves. And that uh, study we expect to be concluded uh, by early next year. And so while uh, we appreciate uh, Senator Kipmeyer's concern, and uh, there is no doubt she is correct that we, uh, uh, North Star Service in particular, has taken a very large uh, hit when it comes to uh, service and ridership during the, during the pandemic here, that uh, we do have, I think, agreement amongst this committee and the, and the council and MnDOT related to the agreement we made in last year's budget bill. Uh, that we just had to amend to have the Metropolitan Council pay for that uh, last Thursday. And I think that allowing the Center for Transportation Services and then for our uh, study to move forward uh, is probably the best approach for us to take uh, right now. And uh, we'll have those recommendations for, for the legislature here uh, early next spring. But um, uh, I will just say once again, I appreciate Senator Kipmeyer's concern and her comments. Uh, and we have significantly reduced the service of the North Star Line uh, since the pandemic. Uh, we have uh, dropped that from seven uh, trips daily down to two uh, trips daily, is round trips daily, and we don't have the weekend service as well. So, Mr. Chair, um, I guess all I'm saying here is uh, I think we do have a plan in place to look at the long-term viability of this project, and we would like uh, to allow those studies to move forward, and we'll come back with a full-blown recommendation next, next spring when we start talking about um, putting together our budget. Mr. Shetton, and just for the record, uh, I disagree with the position of the Met Council on this issue. A year ago, we asked the same question and got the same answer. Not yet. It's premature. Uh, let's wait till we get past the, the pandemic and we'll address it then. And we're getting the same answer this year. I want to point out to you, Mr. Shetland, that this is simply a request to ask the federal government that's going to take time, at least in my estimation, that will take time to accomplish and get a response. In the meantime, the study that you are referring to will be conducted. And if you make the request now as being, as being suggested to you, perhaps you would be in a better position when the study is done to make a, a good business decision as to whether or not uh, you're gonna follow the recommendations of the study or you are going to follow the mandate of whatever the response is from the federal government. I really don't see the justification or reason for refusing to make the request that we asked you to do last year. Mr. Senator Chair, Jasinski. Mr. Chair, can I respond? Yes, you may. Uh, Sen uh, thank Mr. you, Shetner. Mr. Chair. And just so the, so the committee is aware, we have had conversations with the FTA related to this. Uh, since last year, and uh, the preliminary response that we received is that they uh, would potentially be open to an, a, a suspension of the service based on the pandemic, uh, but there was not a consideration for suspending or that or permanently suspending that service. And I think uh, the idea is, is that we also didn't want to make permanent decisions related to that service uh, during the pandemic. And as the study that we're talking about, and I appreciate what you're saying, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, but the, the context of the study that we are conducting or that the Center for Transportation Services is, is conducting is really to look at the long-term uh, uh, effects that uh, the pandemic will have on that, on that service. And so um, while you're saying, you know, you don't know why we can't ask, the council has reached out to the FTA. And again, they did uh, say that they 
could potentially look at a suspension, but also during that point in time, we, we, we received uh, significant federal relief dollars for transit operations that have been put into that service. And that again is one of the reasons why we wanna leave that open to see whether or not ridership begins to rebound or not. And Mr. So, Shetton, is there a difference between reaching out and asking? Have you asked? Uh, Mr. Chair, we have. Could you provide us with the documentation on that? Sure, uh, Mr. Chair and, uh, and members, I can certainly do that. And I, I will also tell you, I, I, to be 100% uh, honest with everybody, I'm not sure if it was a conversation or if it was a, uh, uh, a letter or email. So I will find out uh, that, but I can assure you that there was a, uh, a conversation, but I believe that conversation was had with our um, regional FTA office and not necessarily the FTA administrator. Yeah, I would, I would appreciate if you could provide the committee with the information uh, reflecting that you've already made the request uh, to terminate North Star. I would appreciate receiving that. Well, Mr. Chair, just to be clear, we didn't make the request to terminate. We made the request to talk about options related to are we, the- Are we dancing around the uh, subject? Mr. Chair, now, Mr. I Chair, I think Chair. we're dancing, but I just want to be clear <laughs> that uh, that is uh, at least for- This for, bill for is our requesting that you, is, is to request that you terminate now you're saying that no you really haven't done that yet and i'm of the opinion that i see no harm whatsoever in making the request so that the study is completed and then you can make a good business decision and i'm i'm not arguing with you but uh sometimes we have to be careful with our words and there would be appear appear to be a difference between reaching out and actually making the request that is the subject of this bill. Am I correct on that, Mr. Shatman? Mr. Chair, uh, you are very clear. Thank you. Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I don't know who can answer this question, but I've been on transportation for now six years, and I remember the discussion of the, of the North Star passenger rail for quite some time. And remembering back, hearing some numbers uh, when I first came on, the, the amount that we subsidize each ride. Uh, if you take the overall cost and you subtract out the fare recovery, what was it pre-COVID, let's just say 2018 or the most recent number, and what is it with the most recent numbers of like, let's just say 2020 or maybe of 2021, I know it's a little early for that, but could you compare the numbers of, of what it was? And I m remember hearing at one time it was about $55 per way that it was being subsidized. I think that's an approximate. Can you clarify what that number was then uh, and what it is now? Uh, Mr. Chair, no. Mr. Chair and Senator Jasinski, I will be happy to provide the committee that information. I do not have that uh, available here with me today, but I'm happy to, to make sure I email the uh, entire committee that information here before the end of the week. Senator Jasinski. Thank you. Mr. Senator Chair. Dibble. Mr. Chair, we do have uh, that information. Commissioner Schultz, Senator, can give it Senator to you. Senator I have those numbers uh, provided by the Met Council in a spreadsheet. Uh, it was $39.39 in 2019 was a subsidy per rider each way in 2020 during covid that jumped to 95 dollars per rider each way and it actually escalated much higher than that uh, at, at one point it was with met council numbers 520 some dollars per rider each way um, post covid using federal subsidies in 2021 that number is expected to be 95 dollars per rider each way thank you mr schulte senator jasinski wow thank you <laughs> senator dibble um thank you mr chair i don't mean to belabor this bill i know we have three more to get through quickly um so maybe we can get to the answers to these questions later but my questions are um, the nature of the studies that are occurring presently, I see there's one internal to the Met Council and one being carried out over at CTS at the University of Minnesota. I know they're happening, but I don't know exactly the questions that they're trying to answer. I'm wondering particularly if one of the questions being asked is what would North Star service look like if it were to go all the way to St. Cloud as it was originally intended. Um, I'll be the first to say um, North Star never really lived up to its billing and its promise. 
remember we had a Republican governor whose idea this was. <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, you know, but then uh, the uh, FTA, um, and I don't know, I think the FRA is involved as well um, because it's commuter rail on, on uh, heavy rail track, um, had these, you know, this formula that caused a limitation on the amount that could be expended, couldn't count some of the benefits. We'll have this benefit discussion, cost benefit discussion in a few minutes. Um, and so they decided to clip it kind of halfway. And so it never really lived up, I think, to my, but what do I know? I mean, you know, we need studies and research. So, so. Senator Dibble, is, you, is your question whether uh, the absence of the North Star all the way to St. Cloud part of the upcoming study? Correct. Mr. Shetland. Well, Mr. Chair and members, I can clarify a bit of that uh, in the study that the uh, legislature uh, passed last year that we just uh, amended the funding source for last Thursday. Uh, that bill looks at the, has the Center for Transportation Studies look at the impacts of the pandemic has had on North Star and commuter express bus service for both Metropolitan Council, Metro Transit, and the suburban transit providers. So I do not believe that that would be part of that. The study that, uh, that the Met Council and our county partners and MnDOT are looking at related to North Star is really a uh, look at the, um, at the service itself. And uh, I don't think it contemplates what you're asking. Uh, actually, you know, Commissioner Schulte, uh, uh, has been part of these conversations that we're having. It's nice to have him here today, uh, but it's uh, that that concept is not something that is uh, currently, I think, baked into what that uh, study would look like. Senator Dibble? Uh, I think it's, you know, I mean, I may be way off base. I may be totally wrong, but I think it's an important question. I mean, I think there's a lot of folks who just think, wow, if it went all the way to St. Cloud and back, it'd be a much better line. That may, may or may not be true, but, um, I think we should know. So hopefully someone can ask and find out and tell us. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Dibble. Mr. S Chair, Senator, Commissioner Schulte. Senator Schulte. Osmick. Uh, well, Commissioner Schulte. Senator Osmick. Okay. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Dibble, just as a reminder, there is a bus, uh, rat, a speedy bus service goes straight from St. Cloud to the Becker uh, uh, transit station. So while the train doesn't go all the way to St. Cloud, its riders sure do. Uh, so I think we could, you could make some estimations based upon the number of riders that ride that bus to determine how many people actually would ride the bu ride the train all the way to St. Cloud. Maybe add a few more just for, for roundup purposes. So that being said, uh, question for, uh, Ms. is that Mr. Schulte? Uh, question for you. You defined some per ridership dollar figures. Does that include just the operating costs? That does not include a 30-year amortized cost, the actual build-out of the, of the stations and everything else that went into the build-out of it? Mr. Mr. Schulte. Chair, Mr. Chair, Senator Osmick, it is operations only. It does not include all the capital costs that each county has into it separately or that the state of Minnesota and Met Council have in station stops, infrastructure, park and rides, et cetera. Senator Osmond. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and that makes the number even worse when you look at it. Uh, you cannot ignore, just as I do not ignore the build out cost of light rail uh, stations and light rail lines, you cannot, uh, you cannot ignore the cost of the money that is used to build out the system. A water tower for mayors in the, in the room, a water tower just doesn't spring up or a whole cloth or come down from a tree you have to pay for it and you pay for it with bonds over 20 or 30 years and that adds to the actual cost so while your number is astronomically bad it's actually not as bad as the real number which includes those costs go on an ongoing basis thank you mr chair senator kiffmeyer <laughs> thank you mr chair um i feel that um there is no question that our taxpayers in Sherburne County and Anoka County are tremendously bearing the burden of all this. So while we can't even ask the question and we delay with that, in the meantime, the property taxpayers of Sherburne and Anoka County are bearing the burden of all of that. And even worse than that, two trips a day and not on weekends. 
I mean, my gosh, how much worse can this get? And you realize we are well into post-COVID, but the world has changed right now. Uh, there's more, especially in our area, there's less interest of driving an hour into the Twin Cities. You can do telecommute, you can do telework, you can work from home. I think this is a permanent change that affects the whole situation here right now where North Star and this situation is totally no longer workable, uh, hasn't worked since the beginning, and now we have an option to give greater service and release that burden from the taxpayers. That money then could be used for other roads and bridges in our communities instead of a failed lack of service and all that goes with it. So Mr. Chair and members, thank you much for your time and I appreciate your support. Thanks, Senator. Senator Johnson Stewart. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanna bring up two things. Number one, I don't know that we're post COVID yet. So let's uh, stop. Assuming that, I wish we were, but I don't think we are. And number two, I would be remiss if I didn't remind everyone that uh, we subsidize roads and bridges <laughs> as well. They're not free. So I'm not taking a stand here. I just want to remind us that unless we start charging tolls on all of our roads and bridges in Minnesota, we subsidize each one of them. So thank you, Mr. Chair. I do not see any further questions from any members. Any final words before we lay your bill over, Senator Kiffler? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. In regards to roads and bridges, both the federal money and the state money, gas taxes, and also some money that comes from sales tax, uh, pay for those roads and bridges. So it is a largely self-funding uh, mechanism. Uh-oh. Senator so Dibble. Mr. Chair, that is just <laughs> not true. More than half, we have, um, 90% of the roadway miles in our state are supported by property tax, gen taxes of a general purpose. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Dibble. Um, we have no further comments, and uh, we're going to lay your bill over. So with that, uh, Senate file 3494, as amended, is laid over. Next bill up, Senator Osmick, 3992. Senator Osmick, to your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senate file 3992 and is, is an innocent little bill. I hope you all can support. It simply says that any planning, preliminary engineering, final design, or construction of any proposed gateway is suspended until such time as the Southwest Light Rail, or otherwise known as the Green Line extension, is opened. This Met Council needs to focus their, all of their energies on dealing with the situation. Frankly, I think they should abandon it. That's my choice. Uh, but I don't see that necessarily happening based upon their conversations. Uh, so I think we need to suspend. I'm, I really appreciate the, the bill that we passed on the Senate floor of Senator Dibbles. It was another one of those Dibble osmic moments where we were hand in hand and happy. So I'm hoping this is the same way. Uh, it, all, it does, uh, it does uh, extract out though. It creates an out for the gold line. It is specifically called out um, that it does not apply to rap dedicated rapid bus line that is in revenue operations as of January 1st, 26. That creates the gold line opt out. And I'll stand for questions. Thank you, Senator Osmick. Uh, Mr. Shetman, Mr. Thompson. Please identify yourself for the record and proceed, proceed Mr. Thompson. Mr. Chair, committee members, Nick Thompson, Hunter Transit. Uh, just to update this, so this bill as written would impact the blue line, the purple line, um, possibly even the green line extension, but I, I, I don't think that's the intent of it. Um, and the gold line as would have an exemption if, if we do have that line open by 2026. That gold line itself uh, is advertised for construction now, so the schedule itself uh, appears to be before 2026. So it would suspend three projects, which would, in, uh, but then have them restart in 2027. So we would incur uh, significant extra costs on those projects that are under development in this region, and uh, that's the impact of the bill. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Member questions, Senator Kent. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Senator Osmick, and I appreciate you making the effort to carve out uh, the gold line, which is already well uh, underway. But I do have a question with that January 1st date of 2026. Right now, I believe the timeline would have it operational in 2025, but if we get to the point and it is you know, well along in construction, obviously a lot of costs having been put in there, and we have some sort of exceptional weather situation or something that does delay it, what do we do? Senator Kent, is that a question for Senator Osmond yes. or Mr. Thompson? Senator Osmond. Senator Osmond. Mr. Chair, Senator Kent, uh, I'd be happy with <clears throat> language that more clarifies the situation. I, the intent here is not to the gold line because you are absolutely right this is under construction it is already underway it is not fair to retrospectively go after a line I'm fine with that uh, I'd accept any language that that softened it so that there were more outs available for it um, even so far as maybe even changing the date instead of 2026 to 2027 to give them some additional time um, happy to do so I'm not trying to stop that what I am trying to stop most specifically is the Botno extension. Uh, the, this is the one, if you members, if you remember, we have a uh, request from the governor's budget for $200 million to start down that path. Uh, there are others, obviously. We've talked about those today. Uh, I do not want the Met Council or any other agency working on anything else until they get this Southwest situation dealt with and dealt with post haste. Their energies need to be focused on that. So I'm all open to whatever you might want to change that to, Senator Kent. Senator okay. Kent. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator Jasinski. Uh, Mr. Chair and, and uh, Senator Osmond and Senator Kent, I think any future legislature could also make that alteration <coughs> as well. If you get to that point where they could alter it, if it was approaching that date, uh, they could alter it as well, another option. So thank you. Any other questions from any members? I'm not seeing any. Uh, Senator Osmick, any final comments? In the words of Senator Thomasoni, good bill, good bill vote, yes. <laughs> With that, uh, Senate file 3992 uh, is laid over. Next bill up, Senate, Mr. Senator Mr. Pratt, Chair. Senate Mr. Chair. file 3992. Oops, oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, um, I think uh, Commissioner Fernando wanted to say a few words about the bill that we just... Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Please come forward. Thank you. No. Yeah. That's right. Hi. I thought we tried to just saw the Commissioner Fernando approaching, so I thought I'd get your attention. Thanks. Thank you for the heads up. Yeah. Uh, welcome to the committee. I, I apologize. I didn't, didn't see you. Uh, identify yourself for the record with whom you are associated, and please proceed. Thank you. Chair Newman and Senators, my name is Irene Fernando. I'm the Hennepin County Commissioner for District 2 and Chair of the Hennepin County Regional Rail Authority. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on Senate File 3992. I'm here to express concern that this language will significantly delay transit projects in our region, driving up costs, jeopardizing thousands of construction jobs, and missing out on billions in federal funding. Specifically, this language would delay the Blue Line Extension Project. First on the Blue Line Extension Corridor. The Blue Line Extension is a 13 mile light rail project that will further build out our region's transit backbone, connecting Brooklyn Park, Crystal, Robbinsdale, North Minneapolis to downtown Minneapolis, as well as the greater regional transit system. Communities along this corridor are among the most racially and economically diverse communities in Minnesota. We have some of the highest rates in the state for households without regular access to a personal vehicle and who rely on transit to meet daily needs. We also have a higher number of people experiencing poverty, have a greater percentage of people of color, have high concentrations of cost burden households, have among the lowest adult educational attainment rates, and have felt the long lasting impacts of historic redlining and disinvestment. The Blue Line Extension will improve accessibility by more efficiently connecting residents to work, school, healthcare, and resources, while also spurring long overdue economic development and building wealth for working families. Second on how delay only punishes working class families. Delaying these projects would be harmful and disrespectful to the communities who, along these corridors, have been waiting too long to receive the enhanced transit service they have been promised. Just like road and bridge projects, these transit projects are set up, set up construction workers with careers, not temporary jobs. Projects take years to develop, and it is through continuity of projects that lead to good-paying, middle-class construction jobs and careers in the construction industry. 
Delay would disrupt thousands of Minnesotans who are ready to get to work today. Each of these workers, their families, and their kids should not be wondering where their next paycheck is coming from. Last on how delay means missing out on federal funding. The Federal Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act provides a once-in-a-lifetime federal investment in our nation's infrastructure, including doubling the highly competitive federal program that funds large public transit construction. If our Metro Guideway projects are delayed, we will miss out on billions of dollars in federal funding. That federal funding and the good paying construction jobs should come to Minnesota. Instead, it will go to our peer metro regions currently building out light rail and dedicated bus rapid transit projects like Austin, Memphis, or Salt Lake City. Now is the time to invest in the transit projects position to bring transformational benefits to communities along the line, our region for all Minnesotans. Mr. Chair and members, thank you again for the opportunity to present on this legislation. Commissioner, thank you for your testimony. and, and uh, I look down and now I see your name on the testifying list and I again, I apologize. No I, I worries. I, I'm on there twice, uh, Mr. Chair. Just and just you're on the next one also, yeah, so exactly. we'll hear from you again. Uh, Senator Osmick. I uh, Just a revise on my closing remarks. We have to finish one bad boondoggle before we start down another one. We've already shown that the, there's cities in the new Botno line. We, I call it Botno. You might call it Blue Line Extension. I believe the city is one of the cities is Robbinsdale does not want this in their city. There's no local approval. We're back to square one. Before energy should be put into any other boondoggle, that's my words, we should finish the current boondoggle, which is now at $2.75 billion and go into three very soon. So I respectfully disagree with many of your statements. However, I, I, I think that we should focus on what we need to get done first before we go down another walk, another hole with money. Thank you, Senator Osmond. With that, uh, Senate file 3992 is laid over. Commissioner, you can stay right there. You're up on the next one. I won't miss you that way. <laughs> <laughs> Senator Pratt, Senate file 3990. Uh, I believe you have an author's amendment. Is that correct? I do, Mr. Chair. I'd like to offer the A1 amendment. This is an author's amendment. All those in favor of the A1 amendment, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, no. The A1 amendment is adopted. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And this is a fairly simple bill. Uh, Senate File 3990 prohibits the Met Council from issuing certificates of participation that pledge tax receipts from motor vehicle sales tax and it, it assigns the financial burden of building, operating, and maintaining guideways to be the responsibility of the county and the communities that they serve. Many of these guideways are wholly contained within a single county and should be the responsibility of the counties that benefit. Mr. Chair, that is my bill. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Uh, Commissioner uh, Fernando and uh, Commissioner McDonough, are you in the office or in the office in the uh, audience? Please come up, have a seat. Uh, Commissioner Fernando, this is a new bill, so identify yourself for the record with whom you are associated, and please proceed. Thank you, Chair Newman and Senators. My name is Irene Fernando. I'm the Hennepin County Commissioner for District Two and Chair of the Hennepin County Regional Rail Authority. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify on Senate File Three Nine Nine Zero. First, guideways are statewide assets. Hennepin County strives to deliver a safe, sustainable, multimodal transportation system to serve the county's 1.3 million residents and 42,000 businesses that employ a third of the state's entire workforce. I believe we all share the same goal of ensuring that our transportation investments are efficient and effective at growing our economy, enhancing livability, reducing disparities, and protecting the environment. In an effort to achieve these goals, we've partnered with the state, federal government, and other counties to make significant investments with our local tax dollars to build and operate the Metro's transit corridors. The result is a system of corridors that serves one third of all transit rides in the Metro, has secured two and a half billion dollars in federal funds to our state, supported thousands of construction jobs for Minnesotans, and has generated billions in economic development. These transit corridors improve accessibility for residents with shorter travel times to work, school, healthcare, and resources, and they better serve communities that have high rates of households without regular access to a personal vehicle and who rely on transit to meet their daily needs. Second, on concerns with this bill, 
Senate File 3990 would completely undo the funding partnership that has existed for years to build public transit projects. It would remove local control of locally raised tax dollars. County resources would serve as a blank check for the Met Council, jeopardizing any ability to exercise fiscal oversight and inhibiting our ability to continue to expand the region's transit system. Since this idea was explored last session, Congress has passed the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, providing significant funding to maintain our nation's roads, bridge, and transit infrastructure, including funding intended to keep our public transit system in good condition. Instead of shifting costs to counties, federal resources and new dedicated transportation funding is needed to maintain and improve infrastructure so that we can best achieve our collective transportation goals. Last, now is the time to invest in transit projects across the region. The Federal Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act provides a once in a lifetime federal investment in our nation's infrastructure, including doubling the highly competitive federal program that funds large public transit construction. Now is the time to ensure that Minnesota communities are best positioned to leverage the maximum amount of federal funding to improve our state's transportation system. Now is the time to invest in the transit projects positioned to bring transformational benefits to communities along these lines, our region, and for all Minnesotans. Mr. Chair and members, thank you again for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, we'll go now to Commissioner uh, McDonough. Please I identify yourself with whom you are associated and then proceed with your testimony. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, Chair Newman and members of the committee. I am Ramsey County Commissioner Jim McDonough, and I appreciate the opportunity to testify today on Senate File 3990. It is my understanding that this bill would make the counties responsible for all non-federal cost of transitway projects. As noted in the letter, and I believe we sent the letter that you all should have, um, this would turn the county into a blank check. I think I heard uh, Commissioner Fernando use the same terminology for the Met Council to use how they wanted with no ability for the county to control its funding or what projects it was building. It lets the state off the hook on paying for operating costs going forward. If this were to pass, according to our public work staff, we could not afford to implement the projects in the East Metro that have public support such as the Gold Line, the Purple Line, and the Riverview Corridor. No matter what, in times of COVID, stress or not, this region benefits from an integrated transportation system. The state, counties, and cities have supported a network that helps our millions of residents get to the things that matter to them, jobs, events, healthcare, services, restaurants, families, and friends. As it would be with any multi-layered system, it requires many partners to build, operate, and maintain such a system. Ramsey County has long been a partner in the state and this Twin Cities region when it comes to both transportation projects and transit needs. I say partner because delivering important transportation projects require many agencies to contribute. In Ramsey County, our transportation sales tax and our regional rail authority levy dollars are committed through the year 2053 to pay for the transit guideways in our region. Our funds are used as a match to bring federal dollars here to Minnesota, asking counties to take on a greater transit guideways not only puts key projects at greater risk, but it also is an act of bad faith among partners who have expended resources and worked hard to see long planned projects that are important to our communities and businesses put on a whole. The investments we have made in partnership with the state, Metropolitan Council, have brought equity to the urban core by providing high quality transit to underserved communities. The business community has asked for these investments. Our labor community has asked for these investments. Investments in our transit, transit infrastructure have also made Minnesota more attractive to employers and employees out of state, ease, construct, ease congestion, and help to connect thousands of people to jobs in healthcare and other essential services. We need the state's partnership in funding these investments. I would add, with the new infrastructure and jobs act signed into law, with states and localities figuring out what it means for regional projects, now is not the time to make big changes to our funding systems without real due diligence, study, and discussion. Chair Newman, thank you for the opportunity today, and I'm happy to stand for any questions. Thank you, Commissioner. 
Mr. Shetnam, uh, Mr. Thompson. Thank you. Thank you, commissioners. Mr. Chair. Mr. Mr. Shetnam. Great, Mr. Chair, members, Judd Shetnam, Government Affairs Director for the Metropolitan Council. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak to Senate File 3990. And uh, uh, there are two uh, sections to this bill. The first section of the bill uh, restricts the council's ability to use certificates of participation as a financial tool uh, for guideways. We currently have that prohibition for light rail transit. Um, while I would say that uh, we don't necessarily plan to use COPs for, uh, for guideways, uh, we're not 100% opposed to this. Uh, one of the things that concerns us is taking away a financial tool that we may uh, need down the line, uh, but that is something we can talk with Senator Pratt about. Uh, related to section two of the bill, uh, we are concerned about the significant impacts that this will have on the county partners. Uh, I think that the commissioners both did a really good job of expressing those uh, impacts that will have on their, uh, on, on their systems and our overall regional transit system by pushing all of those costs uh, onto them and away from the structure that we, that we have uh, currently. Uh, I would say, however, that I don't believe that this would be a blank check situation for the Metropolitan Council and our current agreements that we have uh, for our lines. We do have grant agreements that we have to operate within uh, uh, for each of the respective transitways, so I, I think that that uh, language may be a little bit heavier than was necessary. But uh, I, that aside, I do think that uh, this uh, approach is, is a bad idea and that uh, we do need to make sure that our county partners are able to uh, use their, uh, their, their sales tax in a way that helps the region advance uh, regional transit guideways and transit ways. And uh, Mr. Chair, that's all I have to, to add. Uh, I, don't, I think uh, Mr. Thompson's available for any questions that you may have, but with that, um, that's all we have to say. Thank you, Mr. Shetton. Did you, uh, Mr. Thompson, no, no comments? Uh, questions from members? Senator Dibble. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Could, if I could ask the county commissioners to come back to the table. Certainly. Yeah. I texted one of them a little yeah. heads up that I was going to ask them this question, so <laughs> hopefully they have 30 seconds worth of thought. <laughs> Senator Dibble. I was going to propose uh, a theoretical question um, because I am uh, a little bit sympathetic um, to some of the themes that Senator Pratt raises in his bill, like I have been with a, several of the bills that have been presented today, probably not to the great surprise. Um, I'm obviously looking for um, a way to build and operate transit in the metro area um, from and by um, an entity or an organization that has um, a lot more uh, transparency and accountability um, and incentive for um, collaboration um, and is responsive to community input and the like. Um, you are elected officials, your county commissioners. Um, you know, if you're not doing your job well, um, it's your neck that's on the line uh, every four years. Um, if we were, for example, to give counties um, enough I, I completely understand your arguments against this bill. There's just not enough money to both build and operate uh, transit in the metro area, whether that be regular route transit or um, you know, transit ways. Um, so your testimony is logical. Um, but if we were to give you um, enough resources to do what needs to be done and the authority through some you know, alternative entity maybe a joint powers entity that you would be free to enter into, or maybe we could reprise some version of the old RTB, Regional Transit Board, um, and at which a number of elected officials sat, although I'm not a big fan of the Council of Governments model that that represents, um, but uh, something like that. Would, would that be a kind of reform that uh, you think counties would be interested in talking about? We'll start with Commissioner Fernando to Senator Dibble's hypothetical question. Sure. Um, I wasn't around for the previous uh, versions of, of how this was governed, but you had me at resources and authority. So I, I just uh, 
I just started an office in 2019, and, and what I'm laserly focused on is getting meaningful service to residents. And resources and authority in an elected body uh, would enable that type of discussion and accountability um, in a way that I think would be favorable to, to residents in, in today's uh, expectations of their electeds. Commissioner McDonough. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, members, Senator Dibble, I think you're aware I've been around a long time and I've seen in the, com the conversation around governance and funding has evolved over the years. I was here in 06 when we passed a constitutional amendment for the motor vehicle sales tax, the 08 uh, transportation bill that created CTIB. I've looked at governance all across the country and success in other parts of the region. You know, I, I, I don't know that there's a perfect model by any means. I know it really depended, as I said in some of my earlier testimony, about trust and relationship and a commitment to the long term. Our region benefits by that. And when we have um, stops and starts, when we have, you know, uh, peaks and valleys, and the current govern governance system and funding system has evolved and sets us up for sometimes, you know, failures or a rocky road that, you know, our, our residents in our region don't deserve. And so I do think that there's always the opportunity and there should always be the opportunity to look at governance and funding, but be thoughtful and, <coughs> and, and, and have the right people at the table for that conversation. It's not something that's done lightly because it is a long-term commitment about how it works. There's a lot of things that don't work about the current system, and I would argue there's a lot of things that do. But, um, so to your point, uh, maybe a little bit more winded than you hoped, um, but I do think the governance question is extremely important. We see bills all the time that come along and try to nip and tuck at the edges. And with a trusted governance system that not only the public trust, but other electeds and other partners trust, we can spend more time on meeting the needs of our community and less time arguing and nitpicking about what's right and, the, and how do we get that accomplished in our community. I hope that's helpful. Thank Senator you. Dibble. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I hear uh, uh, an openness to having a discussion about issues around, you know, who's raising and who's spending and who's accountable for the money. I think that's, it's a simple question. And, and an appropriate question, Senator Dibble. Any other questions, comments from members? I am not seeing anything. Uh, Senator Pratt, any final words on your uh, bill before we lay it over? Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you, and, and members, thank you for hearing the bill. Uh, you know, Mr. McDonough brought up the idea of jobs. Well, members, one of our uh, tasks this year is to consider a bonding bill, which is often called a public works and jobs bill. And uh, we will be taking that up. The trick here is to make sure that we're using those jobs, putting those funds and resources in the areas that they generate the most benefit. I believe that many of these guideways, which don't include, and one of the reasons we included the reference to the existing statute, is that guideways do not include busways. So they do not include the red line, the orange line, uh, some of the others that we've talked about. And Senator Dibble, I, in my bill, I, 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 maybe it's not as clear as it should be, but contemplated the idea that we may have, like the gold line, that is a guideway that, that has two host counties uh, entering into those, into those agreements. But at the heart, what we've seen from many of these guideways are they, they are local projects, uh, wholly contained within a county serving a, a fixed number of communities. And, and I also don't believe that motor vehicle sales tax uh, should be used to decrease capacity potentially on on the roads that would house those vehicles going forward. You know, it's been an interesting conversation all day in that what we've seen from COVID is, is our com commute patterns have changed. We've gone less from a hub and spoke model where everybody's going into downtown Minneapolis to more of a distributed model out into the suburbs or accommodating uh, more work from home uh, uh, scenario. So, uh, Mr. Chair, I, those are my final comments and be happy to lay the bill over. Thank you, Senator Pratt. And the only thing that I would add is, is uh, ask members to keep in mind that uh, all of these bills, they're about guideways. Uh, and I would uh, point only to uh, 
the bill last year. Uh, we, we put a significant amount of money into BRTs, uh, and um, there is a drastic difference between BRTs and guideways. So that's my only comment. Uh, with that, Senator Pratt's bill 3990, as amended, is laid over. Thank you. I feel like the closer coming in the bottom of the ninth to uh, close the game here. So uh, it's 4.30. We have one bill left on the agenda. It is Senate File 3989. Senator Newman, to your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members, uh, Senate File 3989 is a bill that uh, simply requires a cost-benefit analysis uh, prior to any federal uh, or state money uh, being uh, proposed and uh, requires the commissioner uh, and the Met Council to jointly perform the cost-benefit analysis and the, the various uh, inquiry or areas of inquiry are listed on page two. There's a total of 30, or I'm sorry, 13 um, uh, different areas to inquire into uh, if members have any additional thoughts as to something that may have been missed uh, I would certainly be open to you know adding uh, anything that may have been missed and then I would add on uh, the third page beginning at line 3.1 uh, there is uh, an additional criteria that would have to be looked at and I, I guess I just think that you know, instead of uh, having a proposal to either build or not build, uh, that we should have some better information uh, as to the, you know, as to whether it's a good idea or not. And so consequently, uh, I, I really do believe, uh, as we did with the Southwest Light Rail audit bill uh, yesterday, I think it's appropriate to have a cost-benefit analysis you know, on any of these very, very expensive projects. Uh, that would be my proposal, Mr. Uh, Chairman, uh, and I do not have any amendment to this bill at this point. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Any question from members before we go to testifiers? Senator Johnson, okay, we'll go to the testifiers. Come on up, gentlemen. I believe Mr. Shetton will start, so if you want to introduce yourself again for the final bill of the day, it almost like the <laughs> Judge Shetton show here today, but uh, <laughs> if you want to go ahead and then uh, state your name, proceed. Great. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I'm uh, Judd Shetton. I'm the Government Affairs Director for the Met Council. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak to Senate File 3989, uh, Senator Newman's bill here. And uh, I, uh, we, we looked a little at this language a little bit, I believe, at the end of uh, last session when we were talking about uh, putting together a budget bill. And I know that Senator Newman uh, has, has very good intentions when it comes to uh, what he's trying to do here. One of the concerns that we have is that when you look at a cost-benefit analysis for a particular project is that you're not able to measure the broader impact that connecting a uh, project to our system, uh, what that means. And so you, uh, you aren't able to really see all the benefit that that uh, project has uh, when you are able to link that in and provide mobility uh, throughout our entire system. So that is a bit of a, of a concern for us. Uh, we also are concerned that some of the things that he's asking for uh, in this bill uh, occur at a much earlier phase in a project and uh, uh, before, they be, before they come to the project, there is a, uh, a planning, uh, feasibility study, alternatives analysis, locally preferred alternative that is uh, selected for a project before it even comes to the council. And so there is uh, some, some concern about going back and looking at this cost benefit analysis at, at that time once the local communities have, um, have made some uh, uh, decisions related to that. And then also I'm just concerned about um, on line 1.19 uh, where we talk about um, the fact that we have to look at uh, alternatives at that point. 
I think that this works a little bit against what we talked about with Senator Chamberlain's bill earlier in Senate File 3859, where in there they're looking to provide municipal consent for communities. And now this bill says that the council, when it comes to us, has to uh, look at other alternatives and potentially not uh, uh, work with those communities as, as they are uh, determining that this is uh, the, com the communities or the counties or whoever are deciding what that guideway looks like. And so I, I uh, appreciate uh, Senator Newman's comments and, and uh, I'm well aware and have had these conversations of, of wanting to make sure that the, um, that the cost benefit is, is there, the cost effectiveness. But from uh, our regional perspective, uh, we have concerns in those particular regards. So uh, Mr. Chair and, uh, and members, happy to take questions. I know that Mr. Thompson's available to, uh, to, to answer some questions as well. Uh, thank you, Mr. Shetton. And Mr. Thompson, did you want to uh, speak or just be here for I'm questions? here for questions. Okay, Chair. thank you. Senator Newman. Mr. Chairman, and uh, to Mr. Shetton's uh, three points, uh, as to uh, the broader impact and potential benefit of a cost-benefit analysis, I would have no objection if that particular criteria was was included. Uh, as to the uh, problem with uh, uh, having to look back, and and uh, because some things have already been uh, addressed, uh, perhaps we could bifurcate the cost-benefit analysis. Uh, there most certainly should be some way to address what is done early and then what is done uh, at some later time. And maybe we bifurcate it, but if there is a, a suggestion or idea that the Met Council has, I will absolutely entertain that. Finally, uh, line 1.19, uh, meeting with uh, or working with the municipalities is, uh, or not working with them, I should say, is not the intention that I have in right. this bill. And uh, if Met Council is more comfortable uh, with adding some language uh, that would require the the type of working with municipalities that was uh, in the earlier Chamberlain bill uh, I think that would be appropriate thanks Senator Newman uh, mr. Shetton mr. chair and members I uh, appreciate those comments Senator Newman and uh, I, I do believe that we'll be able to continue talking about this. I, I believe that what Senator Chamberlain was trying to uh, achieve in his previous bill related to municipal consent, you know, we the council mentioned that we would be open to that on guide on guideways uh, if it were uh, looked at similar to how we approach uh, light rail. Uh, municipal consent. And I think that that is a conversation that Senator Newman and I will be able to uh, continue to have and, and uh, hopefully be able to uh, look at, at some alternatives to that. But uh, I appreciate his comments and his openness and we will uh, do our best to, to try to meet him somewhere that is uh, uh, where, where we can meet and both be happy. Thank you, Mr. Shetton. Uh, on my list, I have Senator Johnson Stewart. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have done many cost benefit analysis analyses, <laughs> Anal yeah, um, and it's very easy to do uh, cost-benefit analysis when we have all objective inputs. So for example, on a stretch of road, we could easily do a cost-benefit analysis of asphalt versus concrete because everything I put into that cost-benefit analysis is objective. My concern on this, and I, I again, we're all about um, looking at benefit before we spend money, that's not my concern. My concern is there are many elements of a transit or a guideway uh, project that are not objective. So um, I'm thinking about access and how do we put a benefit on that and time savings, increased use as uh, you said based on now somebody can get from here to here in a much shorter time. I've often thought of cost benefit as I take the MinPass lane in every morning. I know how much I get paid per hour and it's pretty easy, pretty easy to do the math. Am I willing to pay $3 to save 40 minutes? That's an easy math equation. The challenge becomes though, not everybody makes my same unit rate. So is it equally efficient for a doctor to take the in pass lane or a woman who's not employed? What's her time worth? I mean, then we get into some really kind of value statements about benefits. 
benefit. So, Senator Newman, I do uh, appreciate your intent here, but I'm any civil project will always have more cost than benefit. It's just part of society and valuing access or clean water or whatever we value as a society. So my challenge is how we're ever going to um, adequately or uniformly agree on what the benefit of some of these projects is. Projects is. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Other members, questions? Seeing Senator Dibble. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, uh, Senator Newman. Um, I appreciate the bill. Um, appreciate your uh, willingness to engage in some conversation about about the elements that would be measured as cost and and uh, analyzed as, as benefit, et cetera. A um, uh, couple of quick thoughts, and I'll just leave it at that. Um, I, I welcome that conversation, and and will engage. Um, I'm interested in some of the more abstract, harder to measure um, uh, analysis and benefits of, of transit overall to the metro area in terms of positioning it um, as a competitive place. I would suggest also just very quickly, we have a wonderful resource over at the University of Minnesota, the um, Accessibility Observatory it's called, and they have this access to destinations um, metric um, uh, that they use to um, take a look at an area and whether or not the people who live in that area have access to the things they need in their lives, whether they can get there in a reasonable amount of time for a reasonable amount of money by any means, whether that's through roads or transit investments or you know, land use decisions or um, road networks um, uh, that are constructed in a particular way, which also leads me into this discussion I've been having with you about the Virginia Smart Scale model where you first identify a mobility problem that needs to be solved and kind of start with a blank sheet of paper and analyze all of the different kinds of things that might be done to solve that mobility accessibility problem in a particular area so that we're not just reaching for the same tool um, you know, over and over again because you know, roadway engineers are always hammers looking for nails. Um, bus planners are always hammers looking for nails. You know, the, every, every specialty, especially when they're siloed in their various um, bureaucracies, just have their single solution. Um, and Virginia Smart Scale is, is a more holistic way of, of looking at that. So I would enjoy engaging in that conversation with you. Thank you, Senator Dibble. Seeing no other uh, member questions, Senator Newman, closing comments. Only con closing comment I would make is that um, you know, I agree with what Senator Dibble just has outlined. Uh, and some of the topics, some of the issues that have to be addressed uh, uh, could, I think, easily be described as subjective. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't take a look at them. Uh, and yes, we've got some great resources over at the University of Minnesota. And, and I, I really believe that in the long run, it is, would be for the benefit of the people of the state of Minnesota if we take a real hard look at these projects before we get so far down the, the, the line or so far down the road where we can neither stop nor go forward anymore. So I, I sincerely believe uh, having this cost-benefit analysis completed before we get going uh, is a good idea. I really believe that. And I will work with Mr. Shetland and the Met Council to come up with uh, some language changes uh, and hopefully make the bill better. I'm completely open to any suggestions that, that uh, members may have uh, that will make the, the bill better. That is what I have in mind. Uh, but I really believe it is an important step for us to take uh, to try and prevent uh, uh, mistakes or problems in the future. That's all I'm trying to do. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Senator Newman, and this bill will be laid over for possible inclusion. Uh, members, that uh, finishes out our agenda for the day. Thank you for being patient and uh, waiting a little bit past the 4.30 deadline. Uh, with no other business on the agenda, we are hereby adjourned.